Welcome to the Warriors of Grace podcast, hosted by Dave Jenkins. Warriors of Grace is about helping men from generation to generation become gospel men in private, in the home, in the church, and in public through the Word of God. Now for today's episode, let's join our host, Dave Jenkins. Well, welcome back to the Warriors of Grace podcast. My name is Dave, and I'm the host for this podcast. And today we continue our study through 1 Timothy. We're we're nearing the end of this study. And today the title of our study is The Rules of Engagement. And we're going to look today at 1 Timothy 6, 11 through 16. Uh, let's read the text, 1 Timothy uh, 6, 11 through 16. But as for you, O man of God, flee these things. Pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and about which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and freed from, uh, free from reproach until the appearing of our Lord Jesus Christ, which he will display at the proper time. He was the blessed and the only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality and who dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. This is the reading of God's precious word. The United States military engagement in Somalia, commonly known as Black Hawk Down, is a well-known military debacle. debacle. In the armed conflict following the downing of two American Black Hawk helicopters in the streets of Mogadishu, the city became a scene of unimaginable confusion. Somali women and children were gunned down with automatic weapons. American soldiers were captured and dragged through the streets. It was not always clear who was fighting who. Well, eventually military discipline and decor broke down and it was every unit for itself, always a dangerous situation. And when the fighting was over, members of the United States Army walked around the Somalia soccer stadium in a daze trying to figure out what had happened. And there are many military lessons to learn from the street fight in Mogadishu. And one of the most obvious is that soldiers needed to know their rules of engagement. The guidelines that tell them what they can and what they can not do in a particular conflict. Once discipline and communication broke down in Somalia, the American soldiers essentially had to make up rules as they went. And there are times when similar confusion reigns in the church. Christians lose track of what they're fighting for and whom they're fighting against. And sometimes they even fire random. The sad result is that many Christians are wounded by friendly fire. Unfortunately, God has given his church rules of engagement, some of which are listed at the close of Paul's first letter to Timothy. These rules not only have personal application to Timothy as a minister, but they also help every Christian, verse 12 says, to know how to fight the good fight of the faith. And the first thing a soldier needs to know is what dangers to avoid. Good soldiers do not knowingly and carelessly walk into the minefields. And so Timothy's first rule of engagement is in order to make a tactical withdrawal. Verse 11 says, But as for you, O man of God, flee from these things. And each word has a significant meaning here. Dick Lucas, who formerly preached at St. Helens Bishop Gate in the financial district of London, likes to point out that the words, But you are a standard refrain in the pastoral epistles. Each time they appear, they follow a description of what kind of pastorate that Paul hoped that Timothy would avoid. And thus they were used to show the absolute contrast between the true and the false ministry of the gospel. In 2 Timothy 3, Paul warned that Timothy 
that evil people and imposters will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, 2 Timothy 3, 13-14 says. Or again in 2 Timothy 4, 3-5, the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. As for you, always be sober-minded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. And there are many false teachers in the world. There always has and there always will be. But a minister like Timothy must have nothing to do with them. When others are false, he must remain true. When others take ministry as a professional career, they must receive it as a sacred calling. When others teach the wisdom of the world, they must teach the wisdom of God revealed in Scripture. And when others preach themselves, he must preach Christ crucified and risen from the dead. And now, what makes Timothy different is that he's a man of God, verse 11 says. This might be the highest commendation that Paul has ever given Timothy. The title man of God is used but rarely in the Old Testament, where it is reserved almost exclusively for the great heroes of the faith, men like Moses, Samuel, David, Elijah, and Elisha. Like those great men before him, Timothy had been given a message from God. And like them, he must remain true to God in the face of danger. And if he remains faithful at his post, then he will be called a man of God. And what the man of God is told to do is to flee these things. And by these things, Paul means the things he has been warning about in verses 3 through 10. Timothy is to run away from the love of money and its bitter fruits, discontentment, foolish desire, dissension, and false doctrine. You see, ministers are not to be greedy at all. And when it comes to money, they should follow the example of the Apostle Paul who knew when to run. And Paul recognized that ministers need their daily bread. And he even defended their right to draw a salary. But he himself was not in the ministry for the money. And thus, when he said farewell to the elders from Timothy's church, he was able to state that he had coveted no one's silver or gold or apparel in Acts uh, 20, 33. And so the command to flee these things, it's so important because we are not to entertain be entertained or even think or or dwell on false doctrine we are to saturate our head and our heart in sound doctrine in fact the the thessalonians were commended right for receiving the word of god with gladness and joy and and the bereans in Acts 17 they they were commended again by paul for searching the scriptures to see if these things are so You need to search the scriptures to see if these things are so. It's so, so vital. See, there is more to avoiding sin than simply making a hasty retreat. If all we do is is run away from sin, we'll run right into the arms of another. The human heart is like a popular ride at the amusement park. Sins are lined up at the entrance waiting for the chance to get on and enjoy the ride. And Satan is happy for sin to to get a ride, uh, get to, for a sin to get off the ride every now and again, provided another sin can climb on board. And so a man finally masters sexual temptation, but then he becomes a glutton instead. And that's, uh, that's sad. You see, real growth and godliness, it means more than just trading in one sin for another. It means replacing the don'ts with the do's. It means getting rid of vices and replacing them with virtues. It means developing the complete character that enables us as men to serve God well in the world. And this is why Paul tells Timothy to do more than retreat. And he also gives him a rule for pursuit. In verse 11, pursue righteousness, godliness, faith, love, steadfastness, and gentleness. And in a similar name, Paul will later tell him in in 2 Timothy 2.22, flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. You see, the Christian needs to know what to run after as well as when to run. And here the Bible gives the man of God six things to pursue. They're not only the things to pursue, but they're essential character traits of the Christian life. Righteousness has to do with the conduct before other human beings. It means to be upright, to handle one's responsibilities at home, at work, at church, and everywhere else with complete integrity. Godliness has to do with piety before God. And and that's Paul's favorite word in this epistle. And in one other form or another, it appears eight times more than anywhere else in the Bible. It's, it's in 1 Timothy that we're taught to lead a peaceful and a quiet life, godly and dignified, 
in every way, 1 Timothy 2, 2, and that great indeed is the mystery of godliness, 1 Timothy 3, 16, that godliness is a value in every way, 1 Timothy 4, 8, and that there is great gain in godliness with contentment, <coughs> um, 1 Timothy 6, 6. And one of the main messages of the entire letter is to train yourself for godliness, 1 Timothy 4, 7. And faith and love are included wherever Paul lists the cardinal virtues of the Christian life. Endurance is the ability to persevere in difficult times, to persist, as Timothy was told at the end of chapter 4. It is a staying power that's necessary for the kind of military campaign which Timothy is engaged. And yet Timothy is also called to be gentle. And gentleness is, is definitely not considered a desirable quality for a soldier. The poster at the Army Recruiting Office does not say we're looking for a few gentle men, but you see, gentleness has great value in the church, and never more so than in dealing with doctrinal error. In his letter, uh, in, in the letter that follows this, in 2 Timothy 2.25, Paul would advises Timothy in correct, to correct his opponents with gentleness. And not only that, but gentleness, right? In Galatians 5.22-23 that we talked about on this podcast, it's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a fruit that, that God, by His grace, through the ministry of the Spirit, by the Word of God, He is teaching us and instructing us to be gentle. And so when it comes to gentleness, as well as righteousness, godliness, faith, and endurance, the man of God is in hot pursuits. These are doubly necessary for a pastor. In fact, entering the ministry, we read in the diary of Kenneth McRae, means something more than merely preaching the gospel. It also means the consecration of the whole life in service to God. It means a holiness of walk and conversation exceeding that expected of a Christian in a less responsible sphere. And so far, Paul has given Timothy two rules of engagement, one for flight and one for pursuit. And next he gives him one for actual combat. Verse 11, fight the good fight of the faith. This command has to do with doctrine. What the Christian fights for is the faith, meaning orthodox biblical Christianity, which Paul in verse 3 has defined as the sound words of our Lord. And so the faith is that body of doctrine about salvation in Christ that was taught by the apostles and recorded in the pages of the New Testament. And here the Bible brings uh, two things together that can never be separated. Verse 12 is about Christian doctrine, whereas the previous verse was about the Christian life. 1 Timothy 4.16 says, Keep a close watch on yourself and on the teaching. So life and doctrine, they're like bread and butter or cookies and milk. You cannot have one without the other. Doctrine without life is dead orthodoxy. Life without doctrine is reckless faith. But Put life with doctrine, add the ethical to the theological, and you get the light and the heat of authentic Christianity. And sound doctrine does not uh, preserve itself. It must be defended. In fact, Paul uses the word for fighting and the Greek word for struggle. It means, and it refers to an athletic competition such as a boxing match or even a wrestling tournament. Here it's to be taken in a military sense, since it echoes a similar command from the beginning of the letter. And what this rule means is that there are times when Christians, especially Christian pastors, will have to fight for sound doctrine. Now, there is a fight to be fought, and every soldier in Christ's army must fight it. As Calvin said, Christ calls all his servants to warfare. In his novel, Excalibur, Bernard Cornwell writes that a man should love peace, but if he cannot fight with all of his heart, then he will not have peace. An army which lacks the courage to fight will, must either surrender or be defeated. And there were men in Ephesus who lacked the courage and the spine to fight for the truth. And instead of defending the faith, they simply walked away from it. It's not very pleasant to fight. Who wants to get in a fight? But some things are worth fighting for, and those are gospel issues. What makes a good fight is a good cause, and the Christian has the best of all causes, the honor and glory of the truth displayed in Jesus Christ from the pages of Scripture alone. Now, it's popular to say, choose your battles, people often say, and there are times when that's good advice. That's not the counsel, though, that Paul gave Timothy. For the minister of the gospel, the lines have already been drawn. The battle has already been joined. A gospel minister must defend the faith. He must fight for the infallibility, inerrancy, inspiration, sufficiency, and authority of the Scripture. 
maintaining that the Bible is the word of God written. He must fight for the deity of Jesus Christ, maintaining that Jesus is fully God as well as fully man. He must fight for the depravity of humanity, maintaining that all mankind are born in sin and misery. He must fight for the holiness of God, maintaining that God will judge the world in, un in righteousness. He must fight for the efficacy of the substitutionary atonement, maintaining that Christ died on the cross in the place of sinners. He must fight for the bodily resurrection, maintaining that Jesus Christ is a risen Lord. From beginning to end, he must fight for the sovereignty of the grace of God, maintaining that salvation is a choice and the gift of God to the praise of the glory of God's grace. The fight for such truth is the fight for the fight uh, 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 for, of the good fight of the faith in Christ. And no sinner has Paul drawn the battle lines, and he looks forward to the end of the war entirely. In verse 12, he says, Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called. And this provides the fourth rule of engagement. Reach for the victory here described as eternal life. In fact, Timothy received eternal life at the moment that he first put his faith in Christ. Every Christian does. Eternal life is God's free gift to everyone who comes to Christ, trusting in him and his finished and sufficient work and asking for forgiveness of sins. As Paul mentioned at the beginning of his letter, those who believe on Jesus Christ receive eternal life. But Timothy still needed to take hold of eternal life. That is, he needed to appropriate it into his daily life to grasp it, hang on to it, to cling to it for all that he was worth. And the Apostle Paul tried to do the same thing in Philippians 3.12 says, Not that I have already obtained all this, he wrote to the Philippians, or have already been made perfect, but I press on to take hold of of all for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. What these verses teach is that the eternal life is now as well as later. Christians do not get a piece of the pie by and by, but they also get a slice of it right now. Eternal life is both a, a present possession and a future hope. You see, Timothy had the hope of eternal life because he was called to receive it by God's Holy Spirit. And this is known as the doctrine of effectual calling, guys, which simply means that God's call is effective. God's call is like the military summons. It has an irresistible saving influence on God's people. The, firm, the Puritans deemed effectual calling as the work of God's Spirit, whereby convincing of, us of our sin and our misery, enlightening our minds to the knowledge of Jesus Christ, and renewing our wills, he doth persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. And Timothy answered God's call He, when he made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Verse 12 says, And there has been a good deal of scholarly discussion about exactly when this took place. And one strong possibility is Timothy's ordination. But Timothy undoubtedly confessed his faith in Christ at his ordination. This practice continues to the present day. Well, it's more likely, though, that Timothy made his good confession at his baptism. Ordination is a call to the ministry of the gospel. What mentioned here is the call to eternal life itself, a call that comes with baptism for the remission of sins. Like his ordination, Timothy's baptism would have taken place in the presence of many witnesses, for Christian baptism has always been part of the public worship of the church. But by mentioning his confession in this way, Paul was appealing to Timothy's sense of honor. He had made a public confession of his faith in Jesus Christ and had vowed to follow him in the death. And not only that, but he had made his vow in the presence of the church. And as Timothy looked on that momentous occasion and remembered the facts of the beloved friends who had witnessed his baptism or even his ordination, he would be inspired to obey his orders until the glorious end. And Timothy's vow would have been reason enough to keep on fighting, but Paul gives him an even more solemn charge in verses 13 through 14. I charge you in the presence of God who gives life to all things and of Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession to keep the commandment unstained and free from reproach. And now Paul may be Timothy's commanding officer, but ultimately his orders come from his commander in chief, who is the creator and the sustainer of life. What did Paul mean here? We need to ask about the commandment. He may have been referring to the rules of engagement given in verses 11 and 12, or the vows Timothy made as baptism or even his ordination. J.N.D. Kelly thinks that the language in these verses may even come from an early baptismal liturgy. The commandment then is the whole law of God, according to Kelly, uh, of Christ, the rule of faith and life and joined to the gospel uh, to which Timothy had pledged himself at his baptism. 
And in case he needs any further encouragement, Paul tells Timothy that his commander-in-chief made, made good on his confession of faith. Jesus Christ made his confession before Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of Judah, who ordered his execution, as it says in the Apostle Creed. He suffered, uh, yeah, he suffered under Pontius Pilate. Now, Pilate himself does not have any particular theological significance, but he does have historical significance. He's included in the Apostles' Creed in order to fix the work of Christ to a specific time and place in human history. And for many years, skeptical Bible scholars deny the existence of Pontius Pilate because he's not mentioned in any historical documents outside the Bible. But then in the 1960s, archaeologists made a discovery that confirmed the biblical history. In the steps of the theater in Caesarea, they found the following Latin inscription, Pontius Pilate, prefect of Judah, has dedicated to the people of Caesarea a temple in honor of Tiberius. And this is the same Pontius Pilate who before whom Jesus Christ of Nazareth was tried and condemned. Jesus Christ appeared before him to testify that he was the Messiah. And Pilate asked him a simple question in, in John 18, 33, Are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered in verse 37, You say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world to bear witness to the truth. That was Jesus' good confession of faith. He was confessing himself as Lord. At every Christian baptism, the same confession is made. Jesus is Lord. And so the phrase before Pontius Pilate can also mean in the days of Pontius Pilate. So this means that this verse refers to something more than what Jesus did at his trial. His good confession was made in deed as well as in word. It included his work on the cross, the way he suffered under Pontius Pilate. <coughs> and so Calvin says this, that Christ made his confession before Pilate, not in many words, but in reality, that, that it is by his voluntary submission to death, for he ratified his testimony with his own blood, with the sacrifices of his death, better than any words. And whether this is the best interpretation of 1 Timothy 6.13 or not, it's certainly true that even on the cross, Jesus bravely maintained his confession. And as Calvin goes on to say, this gives courage to Timothy and every soldier of Christ that whenever our hearts waver, let us remember immediately to look to the death of Christ for strength. What cowardice it would be, Calvin says, to, be, to desert such a leader who goes before us to show us the way. And so the fifth and the final rule of engagement encompasses all others. Keep fighting until the end. Reinforcements are coming. Help is on the way. And so Timothy must follow his rules of engagement. He will not have to follow them forever. They will remain in force only until the appearing of our Lord Jesus, which he will display at the proper time. 1 Timothy 6, 14-15 says, this short, these simple sentences, they summarize virtually everything anyone needs to know about the second coming of Christ. First, the return of Christ is definite. God will display the appearing or the epiphany of our Lord Jesus. The personal, visible, triumphant return of Jesus Christ has been a certainty since the day he left this earth and ascended to his Father in heaven. And after Jesus departed, while the apostles stood gazingly confused in the heavens, angels appeared and said in Acts uh, one eleven. Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who is taken up from you into, into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. God has guaranteed his return of Jesus Christ. Second, the time of his coming is known only to God. God will bring it about at the proper time, 1 Timothy 6.15 says. And Paul is as uncertain about the time as he is about the event itself. Only God knows when Christ will return, and that is his business. And the Bible repeatedly warns that Christians are not to speculate about when Jesus will come again. This is a plain teaching of Jesus himself. Matthew 24, 36 says, But concerning the day, that day and hour no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father only. Well, some have said, Maybe you can't know the day or the hour, but you can know the month or the year. That's not true. When Jesus said day or hour, he's not speaking literally, he's speaking figuratively. And his point was that we cannot know the time of his return at all. In fact, Matthew 24, 44 says, The Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. You see, God will bring about the glorious appearing of our Lord Jesus in his own good time. God always has his perfect timing. And when it comes to the glorious return of Christ, he is holding strictly to his own timetable. His return will bring total triumph for the people of God. We're not on a suicide mission doomed to destruction. You see, our king, 
He's promised to come again before the last battle, and he will come again with heavy reinforcements to sweep our enemy from the field. And in the meantime, every soldier in God's army must keep fighting blamelessly the good fight of faith. That's what we're to do, standing firm in Christ alone. As certain of this victory, Paul ends his letter with a short victory song in 1 Timothy 6, 15-16. He was the blessed and only sovereign, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, who alone has immortality, who dwells in unapproachable light, and whom no one has ever seen, uh, has ever seen or can see. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. And these words may come from a baptismal liturgy, or an early Christian hymn, or even a hymn from the synagogue, but they also echo the doxology that Paul sang back in the first chapter, in 1 Timothy 1.17, To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. And whatever its origins, Paul concluding doxology emphasizes God's transcendence. God is, is far above and beyond everyone and everything. He's invincible, the only blessed and sovereign, the king of kings and the Lord of lords, verse 15 says. God is the absolute potent over all that is, all that was, all that will be. He is the only sovereign being inside or outside the entire universe. All the powers and all the mid-dominions are subject to him. He is the king of kings, ruling over all the kings of the earth, including both the emperors of Rome and the superpowers of modern times. He is the lord of lords. He rules over all the deities of the world's religion, including Diana, the Ephesians, and all the gods of this age. God is to be praised for the invincibility of his power. But God is also immortal, and the Roman emperors claim to be immortal, but God alone has immortality, verse 16 says. This me does not mean, though, that, that nothing else will last forever. The new heavens and the new earth will stand forever. So will the blessed angels, as well as the bodies and the souls of every human being, which are destined to heaven or hell for all eternity. But only God has life in himself, John 5, 26 says. He alone is immortal of his very nature. Every other creature depends upon God for its existence. And even those that have immortal souls are living on borrowed time. For in him we live and move and have our being, Acts 17, 28 says. And therefore God is to be praised for the immorality, um, immortality excuse me, of his existence. And finally, God is invisible. He dwells in unapproachable light, whom no one, is, uh, no one has ever seen or can see, verse 16. And here the Bible speaks of the blinding, the luminescent radiance that streams from the glory of God. And yet God himself remains invisible. As he said in Exodus 33, 20, uh, You cannot see my face, for man shall not see me and live. God is to be praised for the invincibility of his essence. Invincible, immortal, invisible, altogether inaccessible, this is the great commander we serve. What else can we do but trust, serve, and worship him? If invincibility, immorality, and invisibility belong to him, then all praise and worship and honor belong to him. In fact, that's what verse 16 says. To him be honor and eternal dominion. Amen. Until next time, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you. Thank you for listening to the Warriors of Grace podcast. If you enjoyed the show today, please subscribe, leave a rating on the app, and share our episode with your friends and family. If you want to, you can follow us on Instagram at Servants of Grace, on Twitter at Servants of Grace, or search Servants of Grace on Facebook. You can also find our show on the front page of the website, servantsofgrace.org.